I believe God has given me a word to share with the congregation this morning and to introduce it. I'd like to ask you two personal questions. How many of you have ever had one of those days when you were so pressed for time that you did not want anybody to visit you? So probably you know what I'm talking about. You are so pressed for time, either working on assignments as a student, working on something, but you don't want anybody to visit. No! How many of you have ever had such an experience? Many of you. Second question related to that. How many of you in that frame of mind when you didn't want anybody to visit and somebody turned up? Well, I want you to know that I have had such experiences more than once. But I remember one in particular that I want to share with you. I was working on a particular assignment, not academic assignment, and I did not want anybody to come. And somebody decided to visit the same day. The moment I saw that person, I said, that is it. There's no way. <laughs> there is no way that I'm going to get out of this. Reluctantly, I invited that person in, totally convinced that my evening was ruined. Guess what? My evening was not ruined. Instead, my visitor turned out to be a blessing. Hear me? God actually used him, the person that I thought was an unwelcome visitor, God used him to minister to me. He was God's minister. But I initially failed to recognize him as a minister. Why? He did not look like a regular minister. In fact, that particular person, whenever he shows up, I know he is a long meter. But God used that unwelcome visitor. I even wanted to call him in my mind an intruder. But God used him, even though he didn't look like a regular minister, God used him to minister to me. As I reflect on that, I said to myself, you know, how often in our everyday experiences we fail to recognize God's ministers, because they do not come in ways, they do not come in garb that we are accustomed to. And it's quite often we miss the intended ministry, we miss the intended blessing. Sometimes our response to some of God's ministers is, Get the hint, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, because you don't recognize that that is God's minister. Friends, I'm convinced that God uses as his ministers whomever and whatever he chooses to accomplish his purpose in our lives. He uses people. He uses angels sometimes. Sometimes he uses things, including stones, rocks. He even uses animals. Remember Balaam? He could use a donkey if he chooses. He uses circumstances. He uses situations. 
I want if you could think as you look back on your life of things or persons or circumstances that God used in your life. You didn't recognize it at first, but eventually you realize and you say, thank you, Lord. Today I would like to introduce you to one of God's faithful, and I'm tempted to say not only faithful, but one of God's favorite ministers, even though he's not so loved, but is nevertheless a minister of God. We don't like it because we fail to recognize it as a minister of God. The minister I want to introduce you to today is failure. Yes, you heard me correctly. Failure. So today, put on the PowerPoint for me, please. Today, I want to speak on recognizing the ministry of failure. I don't want us ever not to recognize this ministry when he shows up in our lives. Failure. Tell your neighbor, the minister is talking about failure today. Tell your neighbor. He's talking about the ministry of failure. He's talking about recognizing the ministry of failure. When the minister came to my house, I didn't recognize him. But before he left, thank God, I recognized that was a minister of God. There are times when this ministry is operating in our lives and we fail to recognize the ministry and we fail to get the blessing and the ministry that God has in store for us. So tell your neighbor again, listen up. God has something to say to us today regarding failure. The ministry of failure. I've learned over the years, Sister Barbara, that one of God's most effective ministers in the lives of his people is failure. God not only allows failure in our lives, but I'm convinced that there are times when he directly causes us to fail in order that his purpose for our lives may be accomplished. If we didn't go through that failure, we would never be able to be in the place where God wants us to be. Now may I hasten to say, that does not make us failures. To fail does not mean we are failures. God, I'm sure, uses failure in our lives for a purpose, his purpose. You may have failed an exam. That does not make you a failure. You may have flunked an interview. You prepare and you think you got it all together and you go. It's happened in my case twice, years ago. I really wanted to be a cadet officer in the Guyana Defense Force. I just love to see the uniform. I was living where I'm currently living, and the army was right across. And I knew that if I got the job, I was going to get a house. I was not yet married. I was still a young man. But I was qualified, and I applied. And guess what? Twice. I failed. Afterwards, I realized that God caused me to fail those interviews because he had a much better job in store for me. I did not be, become a soldier in the Guyana Defense Force. Sister Debbie, I'm a soldier of the Army of God. You may have failed, but I want you to know that that does not make you a failure. I think of Thomas Edison. How many of you have heard the name Thomas Edison? Some of you. Thomas Edison, who was he? He was the inventor of the light bulb. Do you know how many times Thomas Edison failed before eventually succeeding? 
He made 1,000 unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. 1,000! When a reporter asked him, Mr. Edison, how did it feel to fail 1,000 times? You know how we replied? This is how Edison replied. I didn't fail 1,000 times. The light bulb was an invention with 1,000 steps. Perspective. He also said, I did not fail. I just learned 1,000 ways that do not work. This is not Nancy's story. This is true. To the average person, that looked as though it was failure. 1,000 times he tried. In fact, some accounts say more than 1,000 times. But he did not see that as failure. He saw it as steps towards eventually getting it right. You may have even failed morally. Some of you. But God has not finished with you. Nor has he given up on you. You do not have to let failure define you. Failure must never define a child of God. You made a failure, recognize it, and move on. I remember years ago, a young lady in the United States, a daughter actually, one of my many daughters, our many daughters, blossoming for the Lord, went across to the U.S., found a place in the church and was doing extremely well. Then something happened. She got pregnant. And it floored her. It floored her badly. So bad that she did not want to go back to church. She didn't want to see anybody. And I got on the phone and I called her. I said, I heard what happened. And I want you to know that Sister Doreen and I have not given up on you. God has not given up on you. I said to her, a bend in the road is not the end of the road. I've used that with others since then. And that just thing just turned her around. Today I'm happy to say that she didn't allow that failure define her life. It refined her. She's better for having gone through that experience. She suffered the consequences. It was embarrassing. But it did not define her. And I want you to know that even if you failed morally, it's not the end. A bend is not the end. A bend is simply a detour. Get back on the road and move on. God wants you to know that no failure, absolutely no failure in your life. I'm going to come down to some very specific cycles that go along with this message, but none. A failure does not have to define the rest of your life. As I come to the pages of Scripture, I think of those who failed but did not allow their failure to define them. I think of Adam and Eve. Hmm. Adam and Eve failed, didn't they? I think of Father Abraham. <laughs> yes, father of our faith. He failed. He lied. I think of Jacob. I think of David. Oh, David. For you, man after God's own heart. 
I think of Moses, I think of Peter, I think of Paul. And the list goes on and on and on. As we are in the biblical background, I believe that the experience of the children of Israel is instructive. The wilderness experience, I believe, is often completely misunderstood. We've often thought, haven't we, that having failed God, the 40 years of wilderness was aimless, it was totally wasted time. Isn't that how we usually think? When, for instance, we read in Exodus 32 and verse 3, I'm just going to read it. It says, the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years, until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. When you read that, you think that the wilderness experience of the children of Israel was a total fiasco that God literally abandoned them. God deserted them. But as I study the scriptures, I see it differently. And I want to read with you again the account. I'm going to project it for you. As it occurs in the book of Deuteronomy. Please follow with me here. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 1 to 3 and then verses 15 and 16. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. This is God speaking to the Israelites. They had come out of Egypt. They should have gone into the promised land. Should have taken a short time, but you know what happened. So they are about to go in and God says, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. Verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Verse 3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 50, he led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. Verse 16, he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness. Something your ancestors never known. To humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. As I read that scripture, keep looking at it please. Did anything jump out for you? I don't want you to answer me. Answer to yourself and to the Lord. Look at that scripture. Did anything jump out? Well, I want you to have another look at the same scripture. And I'm going to share with you what jumped out for me. Look at the same scripture, but I've just underlined and highlighted certain parts that jumped out for me. We are talking about the children of Israel who disobeyed God going through the wilderness. And ordinarily we think that because they were disobedient to God, that God abandoned them. God forsook them. God left them. But listen to what the scripture says. Listen to verse 2 again. Remember 
how the Lord your God led you all the way. Are you getting that? In the wilderness, God led them all the way. Let me read the entire thing. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. That's significant as you will see. Even though they failed God, it says he led them. And then look at verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. The point, beloved, is this. That though the children of Israel had an experience of failure, God did not abandon them. Rather, he led them through the wilderness. Not around the wilderness. Not out of the wilderness. He led them through the wilderness to accomplish in their lives what could not otherwise be accomplished. They did not escape, please get this, they did not escape the consequences of their disobedience. God saw to it that they did not. But through the discipline of the consequence, they are brought to their senses. I think of those who come to their senses after experiencing God's clear instructions, ignoring God's clear instructions and the counsel of their spiritual elders. I still remember with pain in my heart when I was pastoring a young pastor on the East Coast. And a young lady that we counseled with, and we said to her, what you're doing is not right. God's word says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We went abroad. We went overseas. We went to Trinidad. It took a group of young people to Trinidad. This was in the late 70s. I got news. Sister Doreen and I got news while in Barbados. That this person that we sat down with, counseled with, and said, you're doing the wrong thing. God's word says this is wrong. As your pastor, we say, I say this is wrong. Do not go this way. She went ahead and told, she got married. She came back heartbroken. She's still our daughter. She's still a member of the church I pastored. So sad. We live to see. It's sad, it's sad. That man brutalized her, beat her, badly beat her. I didn't go to her and say, you know, I told you that this wouldn't work. She learned. She learned through her failure. She came to her senses. The church still accepted her. I still accepted her. Sister Dury still accepted her. She had to go through that failure to come to her senses, and she did. And eventually she had to file for a divorce. It was too bad, Brother Harold. Beaten up, badly beaten up. Then he got the God to come and ask if she would take him back. She says, can't tell. Today, she's serving the Lord. She got a son out of that marriage. She got custody of the son. And he's doing very well. He's become a scholar. He 
mes fils. Children of Israel did not escape the consequences of their disobedience. Through the discipline of the consequence, God brought them to their senses. The question you're no doubt asking is, how does God use ministry or use the ministry of faith in our lives? From these scriptures that I've been looking at, I want to share with you how God uses the ministry of failure in our lives so that you don't fail to recognize it. In the first place, this is what I'm dealing with now. How God uses the ministry of failure in our lives. In the first place, God uses failure, the ministry of failure, to humble us. That is to empty us of pride. I want you to note again these scriptures. God led you to humble and test you. That's why he didn't abandon them. They failed, but God is using the failure for a purpose in their lives. To humble them, to test you. And then verse 3 says, he humbled you. And then in verse 16, it comes down again and it says, he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known. Why? To humble and test you. God's purpose was to empty them of their pride, and he did just that. Man's basic problem, quite often, we may not admit it, but quite often, our basic problem is pride. I, I, but Rudy, you know what's the center of pride, don't you? I, P-R-I-D-E, -E. the center of pride is I, I this, I that, I the other. And God wants to empty us of I-ness. We're not I man, and, no, 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 no. As for another group, I man and I man and I man. No, 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 no. The center of pride is I. Man's basic problem. The quality of having an excessively high opinion of oneself. Of one's importance. Conceitedness, haughtiness, big-headedness, all of those are synonyms of pride. And God's toughest job very often is to empty us of it, to bring us to the place where we recognize that we totally need Him, to a place where faith in self is destroyed. I believe Moses' experience in the Scriptures is also illustrative and instructive. So I want us to look at this passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 22 to 30. Moses was educated. What was he? Educated. I'm not talking against education. This church talks about education. Thank God for the scholars that came up here got bursaries, that got scholarship. Saying to you that we prize education. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. He's eloquent. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptians. You can kill my brother. You can defeat my brother. So he killed the Egyptian. Verse 25 says, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. They did not recognize that. 
The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers, we are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Moses thought, verse 25 says, that his own people would recognize that God was using him. But they did not. You know why they did not? God was not using him. In pride, he arrogated to himself authority. In his pride, he was acting on his own. He felt that I am God's servant for the hour. I am God's man for the hour. Some went who were not sent. Isn't it interesting that when Moses felt qualified, he knew he was educated. And he felt that because of his eloquence, sure of himself, he really was not in God's eyes. When he felt, on the other hand, that he was not ready, having now been emptied of pride, God knew that he was ready. It took an additional 80 years for the eventual awakening. Don't wait so long. Often the manifestation of pride that God seeks to empty us of is the pride of so-called self-sufficiency. Lots of us like to say, I am self-sufficient. I am able for the task. Thought that we can successfully do things and handle things by ourselves. Our boast quite often is, I don't need you. I don't need your help. I don't need the help of anyone. I can handle this myself. I still remember when Lanham first came and it was introduced to this church. And we encouraged persons. <coughs> Thank God for the work that Brother Harold has been doing with Lanham. Started out with Brother Dez, handed over the reins to Brother Harold. And an opportunity was coming. And I remember talking to a number of persons. One person looked at me and says, Brother Joe, I need I got all the red. He was very serious. I don't need to go through that again. I know those things. He said it with such pomposity. I know this all. God has to empty us of that. So-called self-sufficiency. Self-confidence. Christians shouldn't be talking about self-confidence. We should be talking about Christ's confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's self-confidence. So God wants to empty us of that. I think of parents and their teenagers and young adults. Mother says to her daughter, be careful with that young man you're going out with. He ain't got no good intentions. The parent tell you that. He ain't got good intentions for you. All he's interested in is your body. She looks and says, Mommy, you've always. I could handle this. When I was growing up as a boy, I was told, when you don't hear, you just feel. 
some of you young people, you're not listening to the wisdom of your parents, especially Christian parents, but not only Christian parents. They went through, they know what's going on. And you play your note out. I don't need you to tell me that, mommy. I'm a big girl. And next thing you know, I wanted to say the way the world says it, but you may think that I'm being Let's stick with the scriptures. Let me share about Brother Peter. I believe his case is also illustrative and instructive. I want you to observe Peter's boast in this passage of scripture. Mark 14, 27 to 31. Jesus is predicting what will happen. Jesus says, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, not just spoke, he declared, I decree and I declare, even if all fall away, I will not Truly I say to you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, he didn't just insist, emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will not disown you. All the others said the same, it's not just Peter. So we focus in on Peter now. Wanting to empty him of pride, of self-sufficiency. Jesus, I believe, based on the scriptures, negotiates Peter's failure. You don't believe me? Look at this other scripture. Luke 22, 31 to 34. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. He's asking permission to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. Aren't you grateful that God, that Jesus, our intercessor, is constantly making intercession for us? Were he not, we would be in big trouble. Peter wasn't listening. That you may not fail. And when you have turned back. Strengthen your brothers. But Peter replied. Lord I am ready. To go with you to prison. And to death. Jesus answered. I tell you Peter. Before the rooster crows. Today you will deny. Three times. That you know. That you know me. So Jesus, I believe, literally says, I have given Satan permission to sift you. Aren't you glad that Satan can't touch you unless Jesus gives permission? And if Jesus gives permission, if God gives the permission, you've got to be sure that he got your back. You've got to be sure that he is praying for you. He's interceding for you. God the Holy Spirit is always interceding for us. Jesus is always interceding for us. So even if he allows Satan, gives him the permission to sit to us. I know somebody praying for me. Not just my mother, not just my brother, not just my sister. My Savior is. After all that self-confident boasting, do you remember how it played out? Do you remember how Peter, when he was confronted, this same boastful man, I am this. I will die with you no matter what happens. Count on me, buddy. You got my back, Ekinjo. 
you got my back. I got your back. I got your back. You forget what I said? I will pray for you. Satan desired to sit to his knee. I want to share with you how it played out. You know the story, but I want you to see it. I'm missing a scripture. I want to get it. Okay. I'll read the scripture for you. I thought I had it there. But make a note of it. Matthew 26, 69 to 75. Listen to this. Now Peter was sitting outside on the courtyard. One translation says, warming. Think about it. Jesus is going through. <laughs> Peter outside, warming himself. This cold and he's warming himself. And a servant girl came up to him, a servant girl, came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. Verse 70. But he denied. He denied it before them all. Say, I do not know what you mean. <laughs> Mark says, the gospel of Mark that is, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. He said, and he went out into the courtyard. Verse 71, and when he went out into the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72, and he again denied it with an oath. You know what oath means? Guy needs to say, I swear to God, I tell you the truth, buddy. That's what oath means. I swear to God. That I'm telling you the truth. You don't believe in me? That is what this is saying here. Let me read it. Chapter 2, and he again denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. Verse 73. After a little while, this is going to be the third time. The bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. I was in New York the other day. Trying to catch an elevator and I say, hold it. <laughs> when I reach it, when I reach in the elevator, then he says, I know you are Guyanese. <laughs> I say, how oh, you know? He said, your accent betray you. <laughs> hold it, only Guyanese said, hold it. <laughs> so the bystander says, You are one of them, you're very dark, your accent. Betrays you. Listen. Verse 74. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. This is serious. Imagine you calling a curse on yourself. Thank God Jesus was praying for him. Jesus knew. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have been dead, dead. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Verse 75 says, Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. For the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Please don't miss the point. The only way that Peter could have learned this lesson was by failure. After his experience, then he would be competent to minister to others. Jesus had said, did he not? I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. In spite of Peter's big time failure, we read this remarkable account in Scripture, Mark 16, verse 6 and 7. You remember when the disciples went to the tomb? Worried. Verse 6 says, Don't be afraid. This is what the angel says. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go 
tell his disciples. And Peter, amazing. He is going ahead of you. There you will see him just as he told you. Peter failed the Lord, but God, Jesus, did not hold it against him. And beloved, the same is true for us today. He does not hold our failures against us. So I say to us again, don't allow your failure to define you. Admit it was a failure. Do the thing you need to do. Repent. Renounce it and move on. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. Oh, give God some praise. Beloved, when I ask you to give me a certain time, it's because I've got enough to share. But I'm not going to continue. It's 25 after ready. And I hope I'll be able to complete this message another time. All I've shared so far with respect to how God uses the ministry of failure in our lives is one, to humble us, but it's the emptiest of pride. The other thing I'm going to share with you is using failure to expose what is in our hearts. That's where we really want to go to. But I can't do it now. It's too late. Look at this scripture that I'm going to share with you the next time. Remember how the Lord led you? Why? To test, to humble and test you. That is, prove you according to how the King James puts it. In order to know what is or what was in your heart. Test you. And may I say, it's not that God ain't know already. He know. But he want you to know what it is. God knows what is in our heart already. Peter thought that the Peters was in his heart. Peter thought that, oh, I will stand up for the Lord. But the Lord knew betrayal was there. Denial was there. And God exposes it so that he will see. I can talk more about this. The last thing I'm going to share with you. The reason he wants to humble us, to expose us, is to do us good in the long run. Note that scripture. Give humanity in the wilderness something your ancestors have never known to humble and test you. Why? So that in the end, it might go well with you. That's what God is after. The end product. If you want this message in its entirety, come to the second service. I believe I'm going to get more time there. We won't have all the things that we did in the first service. If you come to the second service, you're going to get the full message. Sister Barbara, would you take it from here, please?